Welcome to the Putting the Public into Health podcast by Dr. Richard Pan. As we face one of the greatest public health disasters in a century, this podcast will address issues and questions from you, the public, about the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on people's health and lives. I am Dr. Richard Pan. I'm a physician with a background in public health, and I'm proud to represent the people of Sacramento, Elk Grove, West Sacramento, and parts of Sacramento County in the California State Senate. I want to share with you important information and stories to help each other during this difficult time. I've received many questions about testing for COVID-19, so on this podcast, we'll be talking about COVID-19 tests and what they tell us. I am pleased to have Dr. Nam Tran with me. Dr. Tran is Director of Clinical Chemistry, Special Chemistry, Toxicology, Point of Care Testing, and Specimen and Reporting Center, and Associate Clinical Professor at UC Davis. He is also a member of the Governor's Task Force on COVID-19 Testing. Thank you so much for joining me, Dr. Tran. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Pan. Really appreciate being on this uh, uh, podcast. Thank you. So, Dr. Tran, how are you involved in COVID-19 testing at UC Davis? Uh, uh, quite a lot, actually. So um, I also serve as Senior Director for Clinical Pathology in addition to those other uh, directorships, and that pretty much means we oversee um, the entire clinical lab services. And with COVID-19, um, there's more than just uh, testing for the virus itself. It's looking for the antibody response for our immunity. There's also just the everyday management of these sick patients, right? So all those lab services report to me, and that coordinated effort is pretty much under my umbrella. And, you know, helping bring up the tests, the new tests, the, keeping the old tests going, and ensuring we're projecting forward to meet the needs of our community. Fantastic. So you must... Uh be involved with all sorts of different types of tests. We hear about different types of tests on the news. So can you tell me about the different kinds of tests? I mean, we've heard about PCR, serology. So what are these different tests and what can they tell us? Sure. The, the, for COVID-19, it really breaks down to two realms, uh, something we call molecular testing. The other we call immunoassays. Molecular is what was in the media for probably the last uh, couple months. And that's where we look at the genetic makeup of the virus to detect it. And in this case, the virus is an RNA virus, so we use a technique that amplifies that genetic material so we can measure it. And uh, typically this is um, using a process called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, and the majority of tests today are PCR-based. And so we were tasked to uh, bring up um, our own assays as well as validate other assays that are out there to be able to deploy. So the FDA regulates us on who can and can't run testing and also what you need to do to deploy testing. And so after February 29th, we were allowed by the FDA, academic hospitals, that is, and other places, to bring in our own tests. Some of these could be homebrew, uh, meaning that we made, invented it up ourselves. And, or these are tests that have received emergency use authorization. And at Davis, uh, we brought the emergency use authorized test first, but we had options to be able to bring in our homebrew tests, as we've heard in the media. Uh, the amino assays are the other end. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, these are assays that we use um, antibodies that we've designed to detect other things. And these could be other antibodies. And that is antibodies that we produce ourselves uh, in hopes of having immunity against the virus. Uh, these assays can also work to detect the virus itself, but right now there aren't any available tests for that. They may not be as effective as PCR and molecular tests, but a lot of the media has now covered uh, the topic of serology testing, and amino assays are used for that. And in this case, we have tests that detect the various types of antibodies we produce uh, after exposure to COVID-19. And that's our hope that as we measure this, we learn how widespread the disease is because we know that there are patients out there that have been exposed, but they don't get sick or they may not notice, um, in addition to those that do get sick. And we want to see how well their response is and, of course, if that confers immunity. Mm -hmm. So uh, certainly people are very excited about the serology testing. The hope is is that if you have a positive serology, you are safe. Is that true? I think the jury's still out on that one. And I, I understand everyone's hopes are on that, but we have to kind of look at it from um, three different perspectives. The first perspective, which is now starting to creep out into the media, is that not all these tests are perfect, and all these tests are potentially good for use. Uh, I've seen some stories already that certain countries have bought millions of these tests and realized they were not that good, and they want their money back. Um, the second issue is that we have to address that these tests, even though they measure our antibodies, not all antibodies produced after exposure to COVID-19 confers immunity. These are what we call neutralizing antibodies, and if the antibody uh, that we produce blocks the virus from entry into our own cells, 
that should help with immunity. But if it's just an antibody that binds to places that don't inhibit a virus to invade our body, then that may not be as helpful as we would want. The third reason is that um, uh, this is more of a statistical consideration. I don't want to belabor the listeners on, on too much of the math, but we don't know how widespread this virus is, and that actually affects how well these tests work. The prevalence of disease, the higher the prevalence, the better these tests are at predicting that you do have immunity if you have a positive result on a serology test. Right now, we don't know what the prevalence is, and it could be 5%, it could be 10%, it could be even more, and we don't know that yet. But there's a benefit to having a serology test because then we can capture that prevalence rate by knowing how many people have been exposed, and then we can backtrack to determine how well these tests work. And that's why it's so important to get these tests out there, and more specifically, good tests out there uh, to assess the prevalence. So, I mean, as you said, the uh, we're not sure when we test these antibodies what kind of antibodies we're testing. So what do we still need to do to figure that out? How long is it going to be before we can say, okay, we have a test that will tell you that you're still that you're actually immune? I think it's going to be fast. Uh, there are tests coming out, uh, as, we, as we've seen, and the good tests uh, that I, we've seen based on data. And we don't really, um, you know, we, we, we base our assessments on the science, right, the science mm -hmm. that comes from these manufacturers. Even today, there's a test that's being brought out. My understanding is it has a very what's called high sensitivity and specificity. That's one option right there. And I know there are forthcoming tests in the coming days and weeks, and that's, that's actually really fast. I just want to point out the context um, that can perhaps look at neutralizing antibodies. So these are things that are coming up soon. The key after that is how many places have these instruments that can perform the test and how fast we can get reagents, the testing uh, chemicals, out to these places to perform testing. And then, of course, last but certainly least, how we can allow citizens in the state of California, of course, in the nation, to gain access to testing, so accessibility. So I think in the coming weeks, uh, we're going to see a large um, surge in serology testing and improving our understanding of how uh, prevalent this disease is and perhaps a better understanding of how immune we are to. Okay. And you made reference to uh, uh, sort of the restrictions on testing. There's been some news reports, actually, as even as we're talking about we need to do more testing, there's actually capacity out there that isn't being used. So uh, who actually should get tested, and uh, are we being too restrictive on who's getting the tests? I, I think, and that's a great question, and I, I think if you ask uh, every person out there, everyone would like to be tested if they feel like it, right? But mm -hmm. there's challenges to that, and I think there's still a, um, uh, a method to uh, still having some level of prioritization. Obviously, many institutions are starting to loosen the, 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 the restrictions just because, as you said, the um, capacity has significantly increased. But we have to temper that a little bit because there is still a shortage on reagents and there still is a shortage on even something more important right now, which are the swabs and the media. And the media is the kind of the preservative we would use to put the swab in. And there's a shortage of that. Um, I'll use an example. These aren't numbers from UC Davis, but you know, let's just say we have the capacity to do 1,000 tests a day. That sounds great, and a lot of places do have that capacity. At Davis, we could all go all the way up to even higher than that if we had to with, you know, without uh, limitations on the supplies. Um, with that said, if you only have 2,000 swabs in media, you're only going to be able to run for two days, and that's it, right? So there still has to be some prioritization just because we do want to make sure that those that get tested are the ones that can change some sort of outcome, meaning that we're going to help this patient who's very sick, it's going to help ensure that we protect our healthcare workers, who in turn also allows us to protect other patients in hospital and healthcare settings. So uh, you talked about some of the uh, exciting things happening with testing. So what does that mean for UC Davis? Is this something that UC Davis is working on, or would we be able to do those tests at UC Davis if they were invented somewhere else? How does this all work? Oh, uh, yeah. No, this, it, it, it brings it together. It's always this you know, public-private partnership that we've always um, um, had with many, you know, both industry, academia, other scientists, and, of course, members of the community. And uh, we obviously have brought in multiple PCR assays since uh, about seven weeks ago, which feel much longer than that. Uh, but we have multiple assays, including uh, bringing in um, the Roche system, which uh, has been in the media because it could do so many tests at once, right? It could go uh, over a 1,000 tests per day if needed. That's based on what we've seen. Um, 
And this has allowed us to do high capacity, but we've also worked on bringing in assays such as uh, those that can perform testing with just as good accuracy, but very quickly in a matter of an hour, maybe an hour and a half, or perhaps two hours. And this allows us to be able to address the needs for more urgent cases where, as, uh, as we see in the news, uh, if a kidney shows up from uh, a deceased donor, uh, we have the ability to test very quickly and allow that person to be able to uh, get, uh, get the recipient to get their kidney because it's a requirement to get COVID uh, screening for transplant patients. Serology, I would, I would expect for us to have some um, interesting news in the coming days. We do expect to be deploying in the coming days a serology test here at Davis. Um, it's a highly automated test. We can offer testing uh, probably between uh, 750 to 1,000 tests per day, possibly even more. Uh, again, we have to uh, uh, temper that in terms of the um, number of patients we have, the healthcare workers we need to test and so forth. So we have a lot of that stuff working. We're also collaborating with industry with industry with various other technologies, including even faster tests, tests that could be at the bedside. Uh, we were also working with our scientists uh, and our, our transfusion medicine people to look at convalescent serum, right, mm-hmm. using the antibodies from patients who've, who've recovered to help others that are sick. Now, uh, actually, it's interesting you brought up uh, convalescent serum. Uh, I, I think people are still investigating. It seems promising. I don't know if I'm overstating that or not. Uh, so does that give hope that actually we will be able to uh, more rapidly get to a serology test that actually has the blocking antibodies that are effective in creating immunity? I think that's what's driving the need, the, the, special, the special need for those uh, blocking antibodies, neutralizing antibodies. So, uh, you know, it would be nice to be able to measure that. And I know a lot of the blood centers, the blood donation centers, the big ones out there, are looking at those assays, too. Uh, I think there's hope for, with convalescent serum, and that's one of the reasons why the FDA gave their uh, recent clearance for a lot of folks to be able to start using it clinically. And there are uh, several trials that are starting now. I know UC Davis is uh, working to, uh, to start with a multicenter trial now. Okay. So now early on, and I don't know if the situation is still this way now, but I do hear stories. People say, well, you know, I've got it tested a week ago and I still haven't gotten the results, right? It seems like it takes a really long time for people to get results. Now, this is probably more people who are getting the test done in an outpatient setting by their doctor or some other site. Uh, can you speak to the um, why it takes so long to get the test? Is it really take that long in the lab, or is it uh, is it just sitting somewhere? Sure, sure. Yeah, it's definitely not sitting somewhere, so we'll, okay. we'll say that first. Uh, but there, there's a different perspectives by everyone, right? Mm-hmm. Um, most of these PCR-based tests um, can, will take about an hour to maybe um, uh, uh, maybe up to uh, five hours, depending on the pl- test platform. I'll use the Roche system as an example. Uh, that, that system will churn through uh, 94 patient samples every three hours. That's pretty fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are tests out there that can churn through results in an hour and a half. There's tests out there that now report 45 minutes. Uh, there's also some discussion of a five-minute test, too, which I'll get into. Mm-hmm. And um, three hours is the time it takes for me to, uh, you know, me, it's really not me. It's really these hardworking clinical lab scientists that do all this stuff, and I'm the one that just gets to talk about it. Uh, they do the real fun stuff. So they load the sample, takes three hours, we'll get results. But what the patient sees and what the physician sees is they, they, they see the total time, which includes the time it takes to transport the sample, the time it takes to, um, to um, process the sample before uh, testing it. So those are the things that drag the numbers larger. With that said, at an academic hospital um, at Davis and other sister University of California institutions, we are typically churning out results in less than a day. So uh, we're very uh, we're very happy, and that's why we we want to be sure that we don't exceed capacity that causes us to stretch out our turnaround times. Where we have seen longer longer turnaround times with commercial labs is because they were inundated uh, with um, samples, and I believe at one point uh, one commercial lab had a backlog of 160,000 tests, if you can imagine. Wow! And so, uh, and plus these commercial labs, they are they're not numerous necessarily, at least right now, with their ability to test. So you have to ship these samples. Some of these places we have to ship to another state. So you can imagine that starts adding time to it. Uh, but uh, going back to the last comment, is there are faster tests, but I do want to emphasize that sometimes faster is not necessarily better. Uh, you sometimes pay a price in how sensitive a test is by making it faster with these molecular or PCR-based technologies or similar. Uh, so there are uses for them. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing bad with them, but people need to know their limitations. Okay. Now, I know we talked a little bit about some of the accuracy issues regarding the serology tests. What about the PCR test? I've heard uh, concerns that uh, 
the PCR test uh, still has a fairly high um, uh, false uh, negative rate. We've heard stories about people who are supposedly positive, recovered, was negative, and then was positive again, and people weren't sure whether they got reinfected or is it just because maybe the negative was not actually a true negative? Uh, can you speak to some of the limitations on the PCR test? Sure, yeah, yeah. There's really three three issues working together, um, and, and we, we, it's hard to figure out which, and that's, that's mm-hmm. the challenge with this virus. The first is um, there are many tests out there. There, I, I have lost count how many there are. Uh, that's why most of our big academic labs are focusing on the ones that have been truly vetted uh, with well-known history of performance. Uh, so I want to bring up a term called limited detection, and it really comes down to how low of the concentration of virus I can measure. Some tests could be able to measure 1,000 viruses per milliliter of sample, and it really is called copies per milliliter because it's copies of the virus's genome. Um, Other tests could be down to 50 copies per milliliter. So you can imagine that, that test could detect really low amounts of viruses. So with that much variation and orders of magnitude variation, you can see that if you run into a patient that is asymptomatic, they have a low viral load, you might not pick it up, right? That's that's one example. So where you hear these um, discussions of false negatives, it, you have to check, is it the same assay you're using? Is it a different one? Is it a multitude of tests? We don't know. Uh, the next issue is this virus is a little bit more interesting than others. And what we have seen is intermittent viral load changes within different compartments in the body. Where we sample patients these days is the nasal pharyngeal region, and sometimes the virus may not show up in large amounts there. If your swab doesn't grab a, a one virus or a couple viruses on that swab, if there's no virus on that swab, regardless of how good your test is, you're not going to pick up the virus. So it's not necessarily the test. If the person collecting the swab didn't do a good job or the virus didn't show up in um, that large amount, then, uh, you know, it becomes a, a big uh, challenge right there. And some of these other meth- uh, sample types, um, they, they'll have that variability. And the virus itself will change in how much it sheds over time, too. So you could be negative one day by a certain test, and the next day it has increased enough so that it, it, it goes past that limited detection of a test so that you can measure it. So technically, the patient has always had it, but it really comes down to technical, biological, and, um, and you know, chemical um, challenges that are confounding uh, what we're dealing with right now. Wow. And then with the serology tests, have there any issues about cross-reactivity? So in terms of, okay, I detected an antibody, but maybe it's an antibody to some other virus? Yeah, cross-reactivity is a real thing, too. And I know that more modern tests, as they come out in the coming days, uh, have uh, mostly eliminated the potential. But there are tests out there. uh, And, you know, elimination is maybe too um, firm of a word because I think it's more so minimized. But there are at least four human coronaviruses that don't cause severe disease, uh, usually don't cause severe disease, and in addition to the original SARS virus, right? So those uh, five uh, can potentially cross-react with some of these tests. I don't want to say all of them. Some can, and the data we've seen, including our own tests, the, uh, the, the, uh, the cross-reactivity is not there. It's uh, very small. And so I think I'm very hopeful with good tests. If, you, if you're going to a hospital or laboratory that has a, a, a good test deployed, uh, that issue should be um, uh, very small. It should be minimized. And of course, always take it in context of the total clinical picture. Okay. Well, so doing testing is not as straightforward as it may seem, right? There's a lot of things we have to work out to be sure that when we get the results, they actually mean what we think they mean. Absolutely. And you know, that's why there's a whole field of laboratory medicine, right? So we, you know, all of us, including our lab scientists, train for, um, for quite a while to be able to not just perform the test, but also know when a result may not be reliable so that we can hold that result and talk to the clinician or investigate further to better determine the next best course of action. So it's all a team effort. Right. So in terms of all the testing being done at UC Davis, um, if someone wanted to get a test done at your lab, do they have to be an inpatient at UC Davis and work at UC Davis? Do they go to a UC Davis medical group physician or uh, other practitioner? Uh, Can someone else send the lab to UC Davis? So uh, how, how do people get a test? Sure. Yeah. And obviously, as as a University of California uh, Health System um, a medical center, we obviously want to uh, 
help serve the community too. Uh, during the early days when testing was limited, we obviously had to test the people that were uh, very sick, right? That, that, that made sense. But now with testing capacity up across the health system, uh, including our five UC medical centers, is that, you know, we're, we're going out there. We're trying to figure out places. And, um, you know, there are other entities out there asking us, can we, can you do testing for us? And we, we look at that. We've brought it, you know, we've brought in partners um, and so forth. So, um, you know, this includes, you know, expanding capability and full collaboration with our SAC County Public Health folks and other public health agencies. Uh, but ultimately, um, you know, if we have the bandwidth and we have ways to connect up to be able to um, get results uh, to people and samples to us, then we can do it and we'll look into it. Uh, I think the challenge is, is that I think actually testing is the hardest part. But making sure that we uh, have give means for other entities outside of UC Davis uh, to be able to easily order a test for a patient, right, and also getting those results back to where they need to go in a, in a secure way, right? We want privacy to be also protected, too. Those small details are not uh, trivial, and these are things that are in ongoing discussions. And I know a lot of these facilities out there are coming up with many ways to reach out further to the community, especially in places that are at higher risk, such as nursing homes um, and so forth. So in addition to the, uh, uh, let's say, commercial labs like uh, Quest or LabCorp, are you uh, working with uh, the other health systems, Kaiser, uh, Sutter, Dignity, in terms of uh, testing and coordinating testing? Um, not directly through UC Davis. We are definitely in touch, uh, as, as you can imagine. Of course, that's where the state t testing task force is um, uh, playing a role. I'm on the task force myself, and you know we're we're making sure that you know these um, um, these hubs, as they were, or or the hubs that will be designated, as well as these existing high throughput uh, facilities and systems, uh, are leveraged to their best capacity. So, and that's one of the key challenges there to be able to bring together. And that's why the governor, uh, um, you know, uh, established this task force. And then finally, um, some people have asked, well, for example, South Korea has been doing a lot of testing uh, uh, in some other countries as well. Why don't we just go use tests from those other countries? Why is it taking so long here in the United States? Sure. Actually, uh, it, it, it's uh, one of the challenges of that is that um, the uh, February 29th uh, date. So uh, even if we had, if I had a million uh, test supply before February 29th from any of these other locations or really anywhere in the United States, um, we couldn't have done anything. It's, it's an FDA requirement. Our, our hands were unfortunately uh, bound at that point. Uh, once February 29th came out with the relaxed guidelines, uh, we then proceeded to uh, uh, look at different assays. I do want to kind of say that we, we evaluate many different assays, both in internationally and nationally. And um, and as you can imagine, I know some of the international tests, I'm not saying it's the Korea one, but I know some from the Chinese literature, they themselves had a 30% false negative rate. And these were tests based on early um, primer and probe designs that are needed for PCR. So we did that assessment for that. So this is one of those key challenges of after February 29th, do hospitals come up with their own home brew? Do they ship stuff in from other countries and have to still bring up the test uh, under FDA requirements and, and at risk possibly not meeting the FDA criteria to deploy that test? Or do we go with a test that has received that stamp from FDA that is emergency use authorized? Not every hospital is like an academic hospital where we could bring in our own home brew or, or do an extensive validation to bring up. So I guarantee you that most hospitals out there went with those emergency use authorized tests, which unfortunately went into short supply. And that's why UC Davis went with a three-pronged strategy where we looked at those emergency use authorized tests, but also have that backup to bring in our own test too. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Tran, and uh, really appreciate you joining me on this podcast. And I also want to thank you, the listener, for listening to this episode of Putting the Public into Health by Dr. Richard Pan. If you have questions or ideas for future podcasts, please email them to senator.pan at senate.ca.gov. Please stay home as much as possible. Stay at least six feet away from others outside, wash your hands frequently, and try not to touch your face. Together, we are slowing the spread of the disease and saving lives. Thank you so much for listening.